From its humble beginnings, Tees ended up with the bulk of civil engineering work on the schemes, dams and tunnels. BHP supplied top quality steel, which had never been produced in Australia before. Reinforcing rods form an intricate pattern in the morning glory intake, in readiness for the concrete which pours from the top. And high-grade cement used for lining the tunnels was made locally for the first time to avoid the hugely expensive imports. Uh, when the bids came in, it was rather a surprise at just how costly it was going to be. So a decision was taken that cut the lining out, but use rock bolts as a structural medium. In other words, put the bolts in around the tunnel, grout them into the, the, the rock, so you actually form a, a reinforced skin of rock around the, around the outside of the edge of the tunnel, around the periphery of the tunnel. So the designed use of rock bolts and an understanding of rock mechanics, that is the stresses in the rocks and so on, uh, all really started um, in the snowy scheme. <laughs> As the scheme progressed, the knowledge that was gained on one project was immediately available for subsequent phases of the project, so that close relationship continued through the life of the project. People who were trained on one project obviously became very competent workers that were an asset for any other project that followed on the scheme, so there was a continuous build-up of that knowledge and expertise. With almost two dozen unions represented on the Snowy Scheme, Commissioner Hudson faced a daily threat of strikes and delays. He appointed Justice Taylor to arbitrate on site so that the work would never stop. But often he himself took a hands-on approach, highly unusual for a top calibre manager in the 50s. I remember one particular occasion where somebody came into his office and said there's going to be a strike at Jihai. That was one of the construction camps. And he said, why is that? And whoever it was said, because someone discovered a, a fly in his sandwich in the, in the mess. So Hudson's words to me were, well, come on, Mr. Besley, which you always called me, till the day I left, let's jump in a plane and go over and sort it out. And that's the sort of thing he did. He just went out there and talked to the people to find out what the issue was. Clearly, the, the screening of that particular mess was not as good as it ought to have been. He fixed it up, had it fixed up immediately, and that, he just stopped them fast. That was the way to do it. Well, hello there, the man from Snowy River himself, I declare. What, doesn't the horse get a ballot paper too? The outback, the roof of Australia, the cities. Everywhere people cast their votes for the party and candidate of their choice. The work stopped on only the rarest of occasions. Those were Election Day, the Melbourne Cup race and Anzac Day. In 1959, for the first time, our wartime enemies, the Italians and Germans, were asked to join the march alongside their snowy mates and to have a game of two-up afterwards at Kuma RSL. When I first started going to the Snowy Mountains, I guess in my 20s, one of the things that really struck me at the time was Kuma. I mean, here was this extraordinary place. You've got to remember that middle-class um, Sydney, say, where I was living at that time, was a very monocultural society, an extremely monocultural, the Anglo-Celtic society. But Kuma was this extraordinary place. Here was this place dominated by these people who were wogs or balts or whatever they were, refos or whatever they were, nasty words they were called. But it was this incredible place that had cafes and restaurants and it had different food. And you glimpsed or one glimpsed, I guess, the potential that multiculturalism had for Australia, but I didn't know that at the time. From Gin to Bang Tunnel and around Ireland Bend, we boys go to Kuma, our money to spend, and we'll buy you as one beer there if you happen to see four Italians, three Germans, two Yugoslavs and me. Now we may not be diggers, we'll have you know, we're digging your tunnels up here in the snow. The barman stood up then with a snarl on his face. He said, you Europeans, you're a flipping disgrace. Stop drinking them queer drinks if you want to stop here. Become integrated, drink good Aussie beer. 
Now we may not be diggers, we'll have you know. We're digging your tunnels up here in the snow. I want to buy a car. Step by step, English became the common language for men from 30 nations. I want to buy a house. They sounded different, but they shared some true blue values, home ownership and mateship. As for women, it was a different story. This was a group of about a dozen Italian men and their fiancés came out from Italy. So I said to the women that they must meet Australian people and they must go to the shops themselves, not just have the men go to the shops. And the men said, well, that's impossible because they're not allowed to go into the town by themselves and they're not allowed to, uh, it's too far out. And I said, well, you'll teach them to drive your cars. And they said, no, women don't drive cars. So I reminded them that I came by car every night, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to teach them. But they said, oh, no, that's all right for you. You're Australian. With men outnumbering single women at a thousand to one, there was good reason to feel apprehensive. The girls used to come out from Cooma. When I say the girls, I might sort of say the prostitutes, which they were. And the men on the wages side would have on their doors, I've seen this myself, so this is the truth, they'd have yes or no <laughs> on the door, you see. So when the girls came in, they knew which, who was interested and who wasn't. They didn't get too many no's. And then this man would come to Cabramara at the weekend, bring his wife and daughter, park himself outside with the newspaper and they went the rounds of the men's barracks. Those who live on the snowy are civic-minded and united. The gender imbalance was used to good advantage by the resourceful snowy wives. Social dances became a major fundraising activity with Lady Hudson herself a willing patron. She danced with miners and mucker drivers and all nationalities. It didn't matter, Spanish, Italians, German. It didn't matter to Lady Hudson if they came and they were polite. My husband always said they pay to come to the dances and it's to help the school, the preschool, the baby health centre or something. You're raising money or cubs or scouts. So dance with them. If they're not drunk or abusive, dance with them. Otherwise, they.